welcome to The Sound Bath with me, Angelina Kalahari, your host for the next hour. The Sound Bath's objective is to talk about and listen to music with particular emphasis on the human vocal instrument in an informative, educational and questioning manner. Today I'd like to look at the singer and the art of communication. So let's take a brief look at what communication actually is and why it might be important. According to the Oxford Word Power Dictionary, communication is the act of sharing or exchanging information, ideas or feelings. And Wikipedia, the free online encyclopedia, states that communication is the activity of conveying meaningful information and that communication requires a sender, a message and an intended recipient. Well, most of us are by now aware of a study that came out of the University of California in Los Angeles in the 1970s, which stated that communication is 7% verbal, 38% through the tone of the voice, and 55% through non-verbal clues. However, Professor Albert Morabian and his colleagues at UCLA actually conducted studies into human communication patterns, and when their results were published, it was widely circulated in the mass media in abbreviated form, and that's where this myth was started. The fact is that the studies were based on information that could be conveyed in a single word, so subjects were asked to listen to a recording of someone saying the same word in three different ways, and then asked to guess the emotions they'd heard in the voice and seen in photographs, which means that the words and the facial expressions would not necessarily have matched. So Professor Morabian's conclusion was that for inconsistent or contrary communications, body language and tonality may be more accurate indicators of meaning and emotions than the words themselves. But he apparently never intended for his results to be applied to everyday communication. And so it does put me in mind of the proverb, actions speak louder than words, especially if we take it to mean show me rather than tell me, or as Confucius said, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember. Because of course, words are the paint that poets and writers and other storytellers such as singers use to create pictures for us. But we are not going to investigate the academic subject of communicology here today. Rather, I'd like to take a broader view and focus particularly on the communication that takes place between a performer and their audience, and more specifically, between a singer and their audience. And of course, tonality and body language is of considerable importance to singers, for whom conveying meaning and emotions is almost as important as breathing. But it might be illuminating, first of all, to find out how we communicate when we cannot hear sound. And it is our great good fortune that we have with us today the wonderful Cassie, whom some of you might recognise from Adamtopia, a fan site dedicated to the American Grammy-nominated recording artist Adam Lambert. Outside of Adamtopia, she's known as the wonderful Christine. So a little background. Christine's career spans over 30 years as a teacher of deaf children, a sign language interpreter, and a teacher of sign language and the process of interpreting to facilitate communication between people who are deaf and people with normal hearing. Growing up in a musical family, Christine studied music theory, piano, violin and voice. But when it came time to choose a career, she realised that musical performance was not her niche and chose instead to dive into the world of alternate communication through the totally visual world of sign language. However, music has always remained her constant companion and refuge. Music and the visual language of signs. Two fascinating ways we communicate with those around us. So before we say hello to Christine, I just wanted to tell you that we are Skyping. She's obviously from America and I'm here in London. So we're in my little computer room and 
it's quite rustic because you can hear the trains go by from London Underground and the birds singing in the garden outside. So And the dogs in my house crunching on their bones. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's fantastic. Welcome to the sound bath. Christine, Thank it's, you. it's a real pleasure and a huge thrill to have you with us today. So I wanted to ask you, can you tell us, first of all, how deaf people learn sign language and communication skills? Sure, but I want to back up just a little bit because there's a common misconception about deafness. Okay. And that is deaf people can't hear. Right. Oh, the poor things that can't hear music. Oh, the poor things that can't hear the baby crying or the bird singing. While that's true, the real impact of deafness is the inability to communicate with fellow human beings, mm -hmm. with a majority of the people on this planet. And the lack of access to all the information that we get in the world through communication, not through formal study, but just, you know, your mother says, don't say that, that's not polite, or whatever. <laughs> all those little incidental learning things that we do through language that if you're deaf, you don't have easy access to that language. Right. So when we know, of course, that humans have an intrinsic need to communicate. And if one mode is not available to them, they will find another way to communicate. And for deaf people, that is through visual sign language. Um, and deaf children can learn that. They either learn it from their peers mm -hmm. in school, or they learn it from their teachers, or they learn it from um, deaf family members. Interestingly enough, they don't usually learn it from parents if the parents can hear because they don't know sign language. Right. So yes. it's an interesting transmission yeah. over time. But um, they uh, acquire the sign language as they see it, just like hearing children acquire verbal language as they hear it. It's a, just a natural part of human nature. Right, okay. That's very interesting, isn't it? Because um, you often, I mean, hearing people would often wonder that. So, um, yes. So how can one communicate the subtleties and the emotions of communication conveyed with vocal inflection and tone if that language is so visual? It, it, it is a challenge, but like I said, humans will find a way to communicate and communicate fully. Mm -hmm. uh, for an example, when texting first came about, it was very easy to misunderstand what someone was saying. They were teasing and you thought they were serious. Right. They could even, you know, that they were laughing when you thought that they were crying or whatever. Yeah. And so there's a lot of miscommunication. So we developed all those emoticons. Right. You know, yes. Know, yeah. Smiley, happy faces and whatever. <laughs> well, back in the 1960s, deaf people first started using text telephones to communicate with one another. And they ran into that problem 30, 40 years before the rest of us did. And they developed their own emoticons or own words that would show the feelings behind what they were typing. Right. So, um, but as far as how the visual language or sign language goes, mm -hmm. It's more than just the hand gestures that you think of when you think of sign language. The shape of your hands and the movement that they make denote specific words or concepts. Right. But like you said, the words are a very small part of the total meaning you know, when we communicate. And so sign language doesn't have the vocal inflections, but instead uses body movement, posture, Mm -hmm. space around the body, and specific facial expressions to convey those subtleties of meaning and intent. And if you remove those and just do the signs, just do the hand movements, they're meaningless. Mm -hmm. Can I give you an example? Please, please do. Okay. Let's talk about the concept of beauty. Mm -hmm. When we in English say, beautiful, you know, it, you hear by the tone it's sarcastic and negative. Right. Or you, know, you might say, oh, pretty. Right. Meaning, well, okay. <laughs> or you could say, gorgeous. Yes. And obviously, that's very intense. Yeah. Well, in sign language, you would use the same basic hand movement and hand shape. Right. For all three of those meanings. 
But for the first one where you go, mm, beautiful, you know, you would roll your eyes, you would have this facial expression of irony, oh. and there would be a little head shake to say, eh, eh, not so. Okay. So, and that would be your inflection. Right. The second one, um, mm, pretty. The hand movements would be very small and unadorned mm -hmm. and very simple. No emphasis to the movement at all. And with your mouth, you would kind of purse your lips like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And um, there'd be a little head wag in there. Mm -hmm. But when you say gorgeous and you really, really mean it, right. the signs get very big and expansive and you stretch them out. And um, then you have your mouth going in a ooh kind of expression, <laughs> and um, there's an emphatic head nod for, yeah, that is the truth. Right. So those are the kinds of modifications you make with your whole body when right. you're signing. Mm -hmm. And because of that, people who sign really lose their inhibitions about expressing themselves with their whole body. You know, I don't know about England, right? but here in America... People are uncomfortable sometimes expressing themselves through their body or touching their body or doing anything blatantly physical. Here too. But, <laughs> here too? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but with sign language, it is all about body language. Right. And uh, so that inhibition has, has gone, and it really makes for a very uh, expressive whole body language, which is a lot of fun. Yes, gosh. And... Gee, I went on way too long. Sorry about no, that. No, no, please. We're very interested because, of course, hearing people don't know any of this stuff. I mean, I didn't know that there was a special gadget that deaf people communicated with long before we came up with emoticons, for example, you know. Right, right. Um, yeah. So um, they kind of did it before or we all did it. Um, but I understand what you mean because um, I once met the highly inspirational world-renowned solo deaf virtuoso percussionist you might know uh, her dame Evelyn oh, yes, Lenny. Yes, yes, yes. she's uh -huh. amazing she advocates listening to music with your whole body um, See? yes <laughs> yes and of course because I don't know what that feels like I can only imagine that it's much the same way that in particular opera singers because that's what I do we spend years studying and training and learning to understand our vocal instrument and sing with our whole body. So I can imagine that that must be similar to her, mm -hmm. to what she's saying. But she talks also about listening to yourself, first of all, and using uh. your body to listen to yourself. And she says you must let go and relax because then when you allow your body to be free and to mm -hmm. feel and experience vibrations of music... You can hear more than listening with only your ears. And I found mm. that so wonderful and so inspirational. And I think we all know deaf dancers too, don't we? Who feel mm. the rhythm of the music and the dance through their feet. And so I would imagine that they too must be using their entire body to feel the sound. And of course, I suppose most deaf people can feel vibrations too. So they might therefore also be able to feel music.